Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alden Landry. I'm the Assistant Dean for the Office for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Partnership here at Harvard Medical School, as well as an Associate Professor in Emergency Medicine. And I want to welcome you all to today's webinar about making the most of your visiting clerkship experience at the Harvard-affiliated hospitals. The mission of the DICP, or the Office for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Partnership, is to advance diversity, inclusion, and health, biomedical, behavioral, and STEM fields that builds individual and institutional capacity to achieve excellence, foster innovation, and to ensure equity in health locally, nationally, and globally. For today's program, uh, we're going to be discussing the DICP's Visiting Clerkship Program, which for 30 years has been a model for excellence offering students, uh, particularly those from underrepresented groups in medicine, an opportunity to participate in externships here at HMS and its affiliate hospitals. Since its inception, over 1,500 students have completed the VCP, including myself. Each year, we host a series of webinars to bring together members of the HMS residency programs and um, the clerkships and medical students together to share ideas, provide support, and address questions on transitioning to the next stage of their medical training. These webinars are opportunities to, to discuss the application process, address questions that students may have regarding away rotations, as uh, regarding away rotations, as well as other students that uh, concerns that students may have. Previous webinars have focused on clerkships and specialty areas, including neurology, dermatology, emergency medicine, psychiatry, and many more. All of our webinars are recorded and archived on our DICP, DICP website, which you can find uh, using the link at the, uh, on the screen. Just a couple of housekeeping notes for those in attendance. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the DICP website along with those other uh, webinars I just mentioned. The chat function is turned off. However, if you would like to ask a question to our um, panelists, uh, please post that in the Q&A section. Um, a short survey will pop up at the end of the webinar, and we would appreciate it if you can click on the survey and click through the three or four questions uh, that are included. And so I want to go ahead and introduce our panelists, and then I will turn it over to them to uh, start the conversation, and then you're going to see me joining on the screen for our conversation. Um, so our first panelist is going to be Dr. Carolina Bibbo, uh, who is the Director of Comprehensive Care uh, Center for, multi, uh, for Multiples Assistant Residency Program Director in the Combined OBGYN Residency Program and Assistant Professor of Maternal Health, uh, Maternal Fetal Medicine at Brigham and Women's in Massachusetts General Hospitals. From Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, we have uh, Dr. Nicole Dubosch, who is the Director of Undergraduate Medical Education, Medical Education Fellowship Director, Director of Education Research, and Associate Professor in Emergency Medicine at Harvard Medical School. We also have a member of the Office uh, for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Partnership team. Uh, that is Lynn Fulton-John, who is our Program Manager of the Visiting Clerkship Program. We have Dr. Isabel Lagomasino. Uh, who is the Residency Training Director for the Department of Psychiatry at Mass General and McLean Hospitals. And last but not least, we have Andy Ullman, who is the cl uh, Clinical Clerkship Program Coordinator here at HMS and is the person who is responsible for a lot of the behind the scenes work that helps the students uh, find pro uh, their opportunities in their clinical rotations. And I want to turn it over to you first, Andy, to uh, just give us an overview of the process that HMS uses to help identify students, uh, help students identify rotations uh, as, part of their, as part of their away rotations here with HMS. Okay, hi, um, my name is Andy and um, I am, as um, was mentioned, the clinical clerkship coordinator that will probably be in contact with you the most um, through this process. Um, as you may know, HMS accepts all their applications through the double AMC VSLO website. And in order to submit applications through this VSLO website, you need to get access from your own medical school. So once you um, have met the criteria to apply, I believe it's um, finishing your core clinical rotations and going into your final year or fourth year of, of medical school, your school will open up the VSLA website so that you can submit applications. And then there's a portion that your school fills out, which is verifying your status at the school, that you have completed core clinical rotations in medicine, surgery, OBGYN, and pediatrics. 
um, as a minimal requirement. And then if you are applying in disciplines um, for things such as um, psychiatry or neurology, you would need to complete core rotations in those disciplines as well. And your school would verify that. They also verify your graduation date and things like that. And then there is a portion where you fill out your application and you submit documentation, such as your um, immunizations. There is um, your step one score. Um, there is an application fee that you need to pay to HMS. We'll go over that a little later. And um, just a few other documents that are listed on the VSLO website. Um, and then at that point, you would be choosing your rotations. Um, that you wish to apply for, as well as the months. So um, currently, um, Harvard Medical School is accepting applications on VSLO through August 2023. We are in the process of surveying all of our offerings at this time. And once we do get the um, information back to make sure that we have the correct information, um, if the courses are still gonna be held, numbers of available seats, things like that, we will open up later dates. Um, but for right now, it's only um, available through to apply for rotations through August, 2023. So right now we have two catalogs on VSLO. This gets very confusing. This is what I get most questions about right now. Um, the 2022-23 catalog um, is for rotations through June. And then the 23-24 catalog would be the July and August rotations. And so once you're, um, you decide that you, you, what months you wanna apply for, there's kind of two different ways to um, go about submitting your application. If you are looking to do a specific rotation, but you are available for, let's say, um, June, July, and August, you would submit an application on VSLO, um, say that you are looking for one experience, put in all your available months, and then select your courses. On the other side, if you are looking just to come for a specific month, but you have several rotations that you're interested in, you can just better your chances by selecting that one month and giving us as many rotations as possible. You can rank them um, in the order that you're in, like you're most desired at the top and then, you know, go from there. And uh, but do know when you're submitting the application that you may be scheduled in any of the rotations that you submit on your application. So if you give us 70 rotations, you might be um, enrolled in your 70th rotation. We do a mini lottery. And so when the lottery gets to you, if there is um, a space available, then we're able to place you. If not, we go to your next um rotation on your application. So just keep that in mind. I think a lot of people think they'll never get their 70th rotation, but we we have run into that during our busy months. So that's um, one way of bettering your chances. And uh, the other question I get a lot about the application is the application fee. So if you are looking to come to Harvard and do one experience, but you want to better your chances, so you're applying for those um, several different months, you would only pay the application fee. It's $115 once. If you um, are, are wanting to come for two months and you select two experiences on VSO, then you would need to pay, pay um, the application fee for two months, so it'd be 230. Students are permitted to apply for up to three experiences. Um, so that is the application process. Then we um, close the applications 90 days prior to the start of each rotation month. And all of your materials, including the portion from your school need to be in by that 90 day point or else when we do the reviews, your application won't be included in that review and it will be missed. So just be mindful of the application dates which are listed on our website. And I'm I'm not sure if that information is given to you, but our website is very simple. It's just xclerk.hms.harvard.edu. And so that is a great place to look for information. It has all of the submission deadlines, required documentations and things like that. So that's pretty much the process of how to apply. 
don't um, know. Andy, I did have one question for you. You sure. mentioned that if you apply the 70 rotations, there's a chance you may get your 70th rotation. Correct. But one of the things that is important is for students to understand that we have similar rotations at different hospitals. And if you can maybe walk through students just to give them an understanding of what they may see if they're looking for a OBGYN rotation and they're considering both Brigham and MGH and BI, or they're considering a pediatrics rotation and they see MGH for children as well as Boston Children's. Okay, yes, so we do. We have several different teaching hospitals and a lot of them offer the same rotation. It's just a different site. So the first, you'll see that the course numbers, they'll all appear to be the same course numbers. For instance, um, a plastic surgery rotation, the course number is SU514. And then you'll see an M and then a, a dot, like a period. And after that period, it'll be um, different numbers. So for instance, the the rotation at BI would be dot one. The um, rotation at MGH would be SU514 M.3. So it's really the last number in the course um, catalog that denotes where the rotation is held. It's also in the course description on the course catalog. So just be mindful that even though it looks like it's the same course offered over and over again, that last number is denoting that it's offered at different hospitals. And um, it depends on where you're looking to do a rotation. But a lot of students will apply to that same course at different hospitals if they're looking to do a certain discipline um, to better their chances, or they will just um, apply for a certain that certain rotation at a certain hospital over various months to be better their chances. So just for clarification for everybody who's out there listening, if a student wants to go to a specific hospital and do a specific rotation, you have the option of applying for multiple months. If you're open to doing that a clinical rotation in a specific area of interest, you can apply across multiple hospitals um, for one month. So there's a chance you could do um, a OBGYN rotation at any of the three hospitals um, in the month of August, or you can apply to do specifically at Brigham and Women's Hospital and apply for July, August, and September. Correct. Awesome. Are there any other... Um, points of consideration that students should think about when looking at our, our catalog. I know it's expansive. I know that some rotations may be offered certain times of the year versus others. Um, any other sort of uh, uh, tricks of the trade on reviewing the, uh, uh, the, the, the brochures as they're looking at application uh, or rotation availability? Yeah, that's a really good point because um, some of the rotations do have specific months where they're closed for various reasons. So whatever um, the offerings are that are listed on VSLO, we do update those as we get information. So unfortunately, we get um, notified at random times sometimes that a rotation is not available. So students will go on, see it one time, the next time they'll come, it'll be closed. Unfortunately, that does happen. But um, students can always feel free to email me if they have any questions so I can clarify um, specific rotations, if they're available, or, you know, I, I just saw it um, yesterday and now it's closed. That does happen. Um, but I am always here to answer any questions for anyone. And I believe that my email is associated with the application. So. Awesome. Thank you. And and, and um, thank you for being here. And thank you for office, offering your guidance on this. I uh, I feel like our offices work closely together to support students uh, who come through the visiting clerkship program, and it's always helpful to have this direct line of communication. Um, and if you don't mind, I'm sure there may be some questions that come up from the students. So, so if you could stick around for the second half when we get into our Q and A. Absolutely. Um, thank you for thank you for joining us. So I next want to switch and just give you a little bit of insight into the visiting clerkship program, and I'm just trying to keep track of the time because I can easily get distracted about. Uh, the program and how much it's meant to me in my career and how much I enjoy being a part of the process with the visiting clerkship program. But I just want to give you a quick overview of what the visiting clerkship program includes. Uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Lynn Fulton, John, who's going to give you a little bit more about uh, details about our timeline when it comes to applying to the visiting clerkship program, which unfortunately ha happens in parallel with the VSAS and it's two separate applications. Uh, as I mentioned many, many moons ago, I was a student who rotated through the visiting clerkship program 
program. And much like many of you, um, I was excited about the opportunity, but I recognize the value and importance of these away rotations. And as you may know, certain specialties place a higher value on those away rotations compared to others. And specifically, my specialty emergency medicine tends to weigh in a lot on the uh, uh, on the evaluations that you receive as part of your um, experiences uh, from your away rotations. And so for me, coming and doing my away rotation here at uh, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center at the Harvard Affiliated Emergency Medicine Residency Program uh, was really Im important to me because it got uh, it would allow me to see the uh, rotation and see the hospital from the inside out. And I truly had that um, uh, perspective of being in that hospital, sitting with the trainees, uh, the interns and the residents, meeting the faculty, working clinical shifts with them, um, and getting to see, is this a place that I felt comfortable? It felt as if I could see myself growing um, and being a part of this learning community and ultimately uh, coming there for residency and, and thriving as, as a doctor in training at that stage in my career. Um, it was a truly impactful program. I, I, I tell this story often. The first day I was a little hesitant. I was like, oh, I don't know about this place. Uh, and by the end of the rotation, I had fallen in love with the rotation. Um, I had fallen in love with the institution. I felt like this was the best place for me to train. Now, obviously, you're all going to have your individual experiences. And I think for us at the Visiting Clerkship Program and, and the DICP, our goal is to open the door and say that you are welcome here at HMS. You are welcome here at our Harvard-affiliated hospitals. Um, and that's the minimum that we want to accomplish. Ideally, we'd like to have you come and have the same experience that I had and hopefully you match at our residency programs after having that experience uh, with your rotation. Uh, something that falls in between is you come, you have a good experience, you receive a letter of recommendation, you use that as part of your application. And it, this is part of the building block that you have in establishing yourself in the career that you decide, the specialty that you decide, with the hopes that maybe we can attract you back for another time during your either your fellowship training or, uh, or an early career opportunity. But we, we really stress the importance of these rotations because it allows you to see, again, the residency programs from the inside out. The other thing I wanna stress is it's really important for you to think critically about why you're doing the rotations and the timing of doing so. And as we have our discussion with our panelists later on, they're gonna give you a little bit of insight as to why it's important to do the rotation, when it's best to do the rotation, and how you can be most successful during those rotations. Just a little, another bit of housekeeping notes about what we offer during the VCP. When you're here for the month that you're with us, one of the things that we do is we invite you to be a part of our community. We bring you to a dinner where you get to meet other students who are rotating as a part of the visiting clerkship program. Uh, the dinners are typically hosted on the first Tuesday of uh, each rotation. Um, we try and make sure that as many students can, can come because I think it's a great opportunity for you to see the cadre of students coming from all across the country that are rotating with you. Um, as um, Andy mentioned, we host uh, students at various teaching hospitals. And one of the things that we also encourage students to do is look at what uh, the other hospitals may have to offer. One of the things I highlight at the dinner is we have five internal medicine residency programs and five psychiatric residency programs. And so even though you may be rotating at one hospital, say McLean for your psychiatry rotation or BIDMC for your internal medicine rotation, this is also an opportunity for you to get to know those other residency programs that are here. And you may not be able to rotate with them, but this is the time to build networks, to engage with the faculty, to meet other trainees while you're here. While you're a part of the visiting clerkship program, we help you to build uh, your own network by establishing mentors. We encourage the students to meet with their mentors at least once, if not twice, uh, during their time with the, uh, during their time here while they're rotating with us. But we also ask the students to continue to engage with both our office, the DICP, as well as their mentors in this longitudinal effort to really help these students. Uh, identify other career mentors and advisors to support them through uh, the ERAS process, deciding on where, uh, how to build their rank list and ultimately matching into their specialty. Um, we also have a couple of other programs that we host. Uh, and if you're lucky enough to rotate with us in September, you get to attend our uh, Harvard Affiliated Residency Showcase Program. It's a phenomenal experience that we do both virtually and in person. Um, but it's a great way for you to meet, again, all of our residency programs in a more casual uh, environment um, where you get to hear directly from program directors as well as trainees about their experiences. And then the last thing that we do for students is any student that has the um, opportunity to rotate with us and ends up getting an interview with uh, our hospitals, we invite you back for a virtual second look. We're actually hosting that for our fourth year students uh, that's going to be coming up next week. But again, this is all part of our longitudinal engagement to make sure that students feel as if they have a chance to really get to know this uh, our institutions before they make the decision on coming here for their residency programs. So now I want to turn it over to Lynn uh, Fulton John, who is our program manager for the DI, uh, for the VCP. 
Um, and Lynn, if you could just give uh, those in the you know in the audience a little bit of an overview about the application process to uh, the VCP uh, and what important pieces of information we like to collect. So as you've already heard, there are actually two applications that are involved in the process if you're interested in the VCP program. The most important one is your VSLO application because nothing happens with VCP until you've gone through that process and been offered a clinical clerkship through that program. What happens with the VCP program is that we have an application that should be due um, that we start accepting at the same time as your VSLO application, but we will continue to accept applications up until six weeks before the clinical rotation begins. So a couple of things to know about the application. It is an online application. The link is on our website. One of the things you need to do before you start the application is to identify the person who's going to be writing a letter of recommendation for you. This person should be someone who has experience in the area of specialty that you're interested in going into. And the reason you need that information before starting the application is that you have to put that in the application because it generates a link to that person so that they can upload their application, they can upload their letter to the application. Um, you can't finish the application without it. So make sure you have that person in mind. The rest of the information is pretty straightforward. Um, we do ask you to tell us what rotations you're considering and um, in order of preference. We do ask for um, a copy of your um, level step one scores. We don't, you don't have to send a copy, but we do ask you to report that as well. Um, the notification for the VCP comes generally within um, four weeks, um, sometimes sooner, of when you have been accepted to the VSL VS, VSL program there. So um, it's a fairly quick turnaround. And Alden, I think that's all I have for the application. Um, and just for clarification for both um, you and Andy, um, one of the things that's expected is submitting uh, vaccination, proof of vaccination. There's a couple other things that go along. Does that come with the um, does that come with the VCP application or the application through VSAS and VSLO? Those types, the, the immunizations is through the VSLO application. Okay. So just thinking about the timing of when these documents are important, um, while the um, visa law application doesn't require a letter of recommendation, that's part of our VCP application. While um, you know we aren't necessarily the ones collecting your um, your uh, information directly from your institutions regarding transcripts and 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 letters of good standing, those things do need to come uh, at the appropriate time when submitting your application. And you are actually cannot submit an incomplete application on VSLO. So it does require that you have all of it when you're going to apply. Excellent. Um, thank you, Lynn. And please stick around in case there's other uh, questions specifically about the VCP that uh, students may have uh, to ask. So next, I want to turn to our two panelists, um, Isabel and uh, Nicole. Um, so thank you all for being here. Uh, you know, you all carry wear a, a number of hats when it comes to supporting uh, students and trainees at our institutions. Um, and I'm going to go to you, uh, Dr. Dubosh, first, because I know your experience and uh, as, as a medical student uh, and knowing you for as long as uh, as I have. Um, one of the things that students think about is how do you uh, how do they pick the right rotation? How do they know when's the best timing to do the rotation? What should they be looking for and trying to identify the best place for them to do a visiting clerkship rotation? That's a great question. Um, and I think there's several things to consider. No one's situation is the same as anybody else's. So I think it's really important to kind of think about, you know, where you are in your training, what specialty you're going to go into, what your prior experience has been, and then also thinking where might you want to go for residency and where can you get a strong letter of recommendation for your for your EOS application. So, you know, a lot of people think about away rotations as audition rotations for the residency program. Um, you know, I think that is true to a lot of extent. If you're going to rotate at a program that you're strongly considering for residency, you want to make sure that you are kind of positioned to do your best, meaning you've had prior experience in medical school that is going to make you be on for that month because people, you know, for better or for worse, um, the residency program is going to be seeing you and they're going to be, you know, kind of forming their opinion and assessment. And then later when you apply, taking that into consideration. 
So for example, um, you know, if you come from a medical school, say I'm going to use emergency medicine as an example. What I tell students in general is to do your away rotation at a place where you're strongly considering for residency after you've already done one month in emergency medicine. About 50%, actually, I think it's a little bit more than 50% of medical schools currently require emergency medicine as one of the core clinical rotations in the third year. Um, Harvard Medical School is actually in the minority and that we do not. So I advise students, if you're doing a visiting rotation, again, at a place where you really are strongly considering ranking highly for residency, have at least done a month in that specialty before. Um, now, I realize some medical schools do not have emergency medicine rotations at their home programs, which is completely okay. So if you're going to do a first one, either, you know, kind of be in that mindset that this is going to be your first rotation, you're going to be, you know, you want to perform your best or consider doing whether it's a community site at an affiliated program connected with your medical school or another program before that audition rotation. So again, you can really kind of show off you know, who you are. Things to consider, again, it's a big commitment to go away for an entire month, find housing in a new city, you know, kind of establish yourself. Think about, you know, with the timing, you want to be your best. So don't do it after you, you know, finish, you know, Sunday night, an ICU sub I at your home institution where you're on nights, and then you have to travel to a new city that's unknown to you and start fresh Monday morning. So make sure you're not going to be burned out by the time you get to that away or auditioning rotation. Think about where you might want to go for residency. This experience can be really fun. You get to see a new city. You get to kind of do a mini, like, you know, they're they're looking at you, but you're also looking at the program, like Dr. Landry was saying. Are these people I want to potentially train with in residency? Is this a city I can see myself living in? Kind of what's the feel? So think about that when you're picking your away rotations as well. Uh, thank you. Uh Next, we're going to go to you, Dr. Lago Massino. Um, one of the things that we stress is you have to be comfortable, right? You want to find a place that you're going to be uh, excited to learn. It's a little, you know, treacherous for students in this because they're looking on websites and trying to make the decisions on, you know, what they may have heard from others or they may be referring uh, to prior experiences um, with hospitals or, you know, maybe uh, a summer experience, but they may not have all the details and data about the hospitals or the residency programs. So even in this early stage, what should students be looking for as they identify programs to potentially rotate at uh, for, for their uh, visiting clerkship rotation? Um, yeah, um, I think that can always be kind of tricky, right? It's, it's, it's hard to see into how do you how do you look into the window of what an experience might be like and how comfortable you would feel. Um, I have to say, I also did a visiting clerkship at MGH when I was a medical student, and then I came it was my number one choice for residency. And here I am back again, even though I've spent some time away from the institution. So I think it can be very, very powerful. Um, I certainly tried to learn as much as I could about it ahead of time, right? Uh, to, uh, I think in this day and age, you know, kind of looking at the website, trying to peruse materials, talking to other people who've been, you know, kind of to those institutions, whether it's the faculty at your school, other students who may have rotated at those schools. Um, for me, it was really important too to choose uh, a rotation where that was kind of a core resonant rotation. That's another component to really get a good feel of the place. I know sometimes students will rotate where it's maybe only, it's it's kind of a less central rotation. It might just be faculty only, but I think if you're coming thinking about what I feel comfortable here as a resident, kind of landing into a rotation if you can, where there are other residents and you can see yourself as part of that group uh, would be really important. Um, so I guess, yeah, I mean, I think really reading as much as you can, talking to as many people as you can, um, you know, reaching out to people in the area, if there are people into the area, I think being able to land into this organized program is really important, uh, as opposed to, you know, you might be considering clerkships in other institutions where they don't have an organized experience like this, uh, for students. Um, so I, I guess that's what I, that's, that's what I would do. Thank you. Um, you know, Nicole, we sort of tiptoed into this a little bit about the value of the rotation. For some specialties, uh, oil rotations are truly the coin of the realm when it comes to the applications. And for others, it can potentially, you know, 
be something that hurts you when you're applying uh, to this. Can you talk a little bit about the value of an away rotation, not just for emergency medicine, which we know it's very important, but even for other specialties? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think it's very specialty dependent. So for example, emergency medicine, I think orthopedics place a lot of weight on the visiting rotation. So pretty much most applicants will do a visiting rotation that is weighed highly in the residency review process. Other specialties do not require one and do not place as much weight. So I think the first step is to get an understanding within the specialty to which you're applying what that value is. Um, to kind of, you know, talk about your point, Alden, how can, how can this be weighed? I think, you know, from my experience, you know, seeing, you know, the residency selection process and seeing kind of from the student side, I think if you are a student who does very well clinically, um, and you might not have gotten, you know, based on your statistics, again, looking at prior students, talking with your advisors at your school, if it's unlikely that you're going to get an interview at a program and it's your dream program, um, kind of just based on your application, and you think you can perform strong, very well clinically, that will help you in your away rotation. We've had many, many students come through from the visiting clerkship program and other, you know, other students who apply for away rotations. <laughs> We would not gotten an interview at our program. They come here, they do really well, and they match at our program for residency. Um, kind of on the contrary, if you are the superstar applicant, you have all these first author publications and big journals, you've honored every single rotation, you've got, you, you know, they're not looking at step one scores anymore, but you, you know, did you gotten the highest percentile for step two, et cetera. In a way, rotation actually in this case might not help you and could actually hurt you if you don't otherwise perform as well as you are on paper. This isn't to scare anyone. Um, you know, I think it's good for your own development and choosing where to go for residency to, to get experience, but keep that in mind if you are on that other end where you are the stellar applicant, I would recommend not doing more than perhaps one away rotation, if that, depending on your specialty. And again, this is something you can talk about. I would I would encourage you to talk about with your advisors at your medical school to get an, and say you want an honest kind of realistic view of where you stand as you're choosing your your away rotation. So Isabel, you mentioned that you did an away rotation and you came here to MGH. Um, I would love to know your thoughts on how students can use this time to get to know a new community, especially those who may have never lived in the Northeast or uh, may have had limited interactions with uh, the city of Boston. So how, how can people use these experiences to get to know the city as well as the communities that they're potentially going to be a part of and where the patients that they're caring for are going to be coming from? Yeah, I think the most important thing to do is to come with a really open attitude. Um, you know, to really come with an open attitude. I always, I always would tell myself, like, if anybody invites me to anything, even if I don't want to go, I'm going because, <laughs> because I might meet someone there, right, who, who I might hit it off with or learn something through that person. So I think it's really important to come with a really open attitude um, to try to, I, I mentioned trying to land uh, where you can meet residents, trying to engage with residents, trying to engage with other students, trying to engage through this program, right? You mentioned the Tuesday dinners, uh, trying to meet as many people as you can and learn as much as you can uh, while you're here. Um, you know, for me, it's interesting. I, I think I was a strong student in my school, but for me, it was really about finding like, what would I like? Do you know what I mean? Like uh, it was a real opportunity. I went to two places. I loved MGH and the other rotation that I thought I would love, I thought was terrible. Like I couldn't imagine myself there. So I was really glad that I had actually, you know, experienced very different uh, systems and styles. But I, but I think in both really trying to connect with people, um, engage in kind of the, whatever academic opportunities are available, whatever social opportunities are available, um, visiting and seeing as much of the city as you can. Um, that's as much of the important work of the rotation as the rotation itself. Sure. Um, one of the things that I think is important is to understand the expectations of the rotations. Um, so, Nicole, what are the typical expectations of students during their away rotations? Um, and how do we make sure that students at least understand what they're uh, expected to do to uh, be successful in their, in their experience? 
Great question. Um, I think, you know, there's not one kind of recipe for what your rotation is going to be. Different specialties, different institutions have completely different schedules, um, you know, different shift patterns, different other non-clinical expectations, whether it's simulation or didactics or an exam. Um, this should be available on the website or this should be readily available if you email the contact person on the clerkship. So absolutely review that in making your decision to apply. Um, you know, for us in emergency medicine in the summer, we get many, many visiting students where we are full every month. So there's very little room in the schedule. It's a templated schedule. You're going to work days. You're going to work weekends. You're going to work overnights. Um, most students, I think, understand this. I have had some students in the past who said, oh, I'm going on vacation in the middle of the rotation for a week with my family, or I have to leave early for this or that. Emergencies obviously come up in life. And, you know, I think most reasonable places will accommodate that or illness or whatnot. But if you have big life events during your away rotation month, I would say like vacations or whatnot, pick a different month, expect to be there and be present the whole time. I can say the one universal thing is to pay attention to punctuality and professionalism. Half of doing well on your rotation is showing up on time, making sure you're there for all of the required commitments in order to get that, that high grade or depending on the grading system. That literally is half of what is important and people are going to pay attention to who are on the residency selection committees and faculty and residents who you're working with. And for you, Isabel, one of the things that you know, is important is, you know, the basics, showing up on time, being accountable, things like that. But a lot of students really want to excel. They want to shine. So what are you looking for in a student and how do they separate themselves from the other students that are rotating and really show that they can operate on that or they can perform at a high level, um, even as a fourth year medical student? Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, I think that one important thing to do would actually be to uh, check in on what the expectations are, right? I think a lot of us operate without having a lot of communication about what expectations and are and what is excellence, and it can be very hard to know. But I think one thing that you can do is actually even to ask, do you know, like, what are the expectations on this rotation? How can I excel in this rotation? Um, opening kind of a communication with your the residents that you're working with, with the faculty, both I think are really critical. You know, uh, it's not just the faculty, right, but the residents too will be very important to your experience. Um, seeking feedback about how you're doing. I mean, I've seen students who will ask to meet weekly, right, with the, with the core resident that they're working with or with one of the main faculty to get feedback on their experience and what they could be doing more. I think not, you know, being, not being scared to kind of engage in that conversation, uh, to kind of really figure out what people are looking for and to excel in that way. Um, but I think if you, I mean, in, in, in addition to that, though, just really making the most of it, you know, really being present, really making the most of it. Um, I remember this year, and I do like for the residency application time, right? I check in with all the services who had students to see what was the student like on rotation. Um, and a lot of what we like to hear is that they actually just really worked hard, that they really applied themselves. Like I still remember stories like about one student that maybe his application wasn't as strong, but the, the chief resident there told me how he had lent him books and how he would stay and he would read up all these books and he would follow up on questions or how he did a presentation that he didn't have to do. Um, so I think just really working hard, showing that you can take advantage of opportunity. Um, and then, you know, getting along with the residents. I mean, I think the other part is though, it's it's it can be a little bit hard because you also don't wanna be such a gunner, do you know what I mean? And so tense that you come across as, you know what I mean? Too, almost like too driven and someone not fun to work with, you know what I mean? So I think, you know, working hard, enjoying the experience, getting what you can out of it, but also kind of being yourself and having fun in the experience so people can see who you are. Um, those things are important. You know, oftentimes students do these away rotations because they want to have interactions with the other trainees to get to know who they might be their senior residents when they're there, and also with the residency program leadership or other faculty. Um, Nicole, can you tell me how students can both um, how students can maximize their opportunities to engage with other trainees as well as the leadership when they're on their rotations? 
Yeah, great question. Um, and I, I've seen this before and I actually had this experience. I was also a, a way, did an away rotation here in the emergency department. In fact, Alden, I think I worked a shift with you when I was a fourth year medical student and you were an early attending. Um, so you didn't, you didn't scare me away from this. <laughs> um, you know, I think there are lots of opportunities. You're here for a month. You're going to be at your site, and that is like your home for a month. Um, many programs will invite you to attend the residency didactic, so you can see how the residents interact with each other. Um, we have lunches every Wednesday for our residents, and students are welcome to join. And I encourage students, if you don't have a clinical shift or before your shift, go in and sit down and have lunch with the residents. The um, oftentimes students are invited to other departmental activities like journal clubs, um, you know, in emergency medicine, we work weird hours. It's very much a team sport. We'll often go out to breakfast after an overnight shift or go out after an evening shift and go to, down the street to Tasty Burger. Lots of opportunities pop up. And I would say, you know, really immerse yourself in the month and be open to going out. I remember I came to Boston. I'm from the Midwest, like born and raised, went to medical school there came to Boston on a whim for an away rotation, never thought I'd actually move to the East Coast. I didn't know anyone out here, but I remember forcing myself to, you know, not forcing, but I was more of a introvert to go out and, you know, go out with the residents and go out with the other students as part of the program. And it was really fun. Um, and I still actually see some of the students I rotated with who ended up going to different residency programs at conferences and at, um, you know, CME courses and whatnot. Isabel, um, a question for you is um, students come to away rotations um, in part some it's an audition rotation for those students at that at that residency program, but we all know that students are going to be applying to a number of other residency programs and they come potentially looking for a letter of recommendation. Um, any thoughts or recommendations on how students should approach that process of going from student rotating to student asking for a letter of recommendation and when should they ask for it and how do they go about doing so. Uh, yeah, I think that's one of the really valuable things, right, from the experience, other than the experience itself, is to have someone from outside your institution write a letter for you. Um, I think uh, definitely, I I think maybe different, uh, I should say specialties may differ in this regard, but usually my recommendation is to ask the person who knows you best, do you know what I mean, who, can, who, who you really had contact with and, and who can really speak to um, you know, what your performance is like and what you are like a person to work with. I think sometimes students might go for the person who's the chief or, you know, who is of a higher academic standing. At least in psychiatry, it makes a lot more difference. Um, you know, you can have more of a earlier level faculty, but who really knows you can really speak to your character and, and what it's like to work with you. For us, that's a lot more important, someone that really knows you well. Um, I guess kind of similar to what I said before, really trying to identify who who's the main person that you're working with, trying to meet with that person, uh, trying to get feedback from that person, understand their expectations, developing that relationship. That's who I would ask for the letter. Um, and I, I don't know if other, you know, you think otherwise. I mean, usually it's toward the end of the road before you're, I, I would ask for a letter before you leave, uh, but toward the end of the rotation. So they've had, you know, as much experience as possible. Uh, but certainly before you leave the rotation. And Nicole, just, you know, emergency medicine is very specific to this. So maybe some insights as uh, specific to Ian. Yeah. So I think, you know, whatever you're rotating, whatever specialty you're rotating in, be familiar with, you know, the letters of ex recommendation expectations for applying for residency. In emergency medicine, we have something called the SLOW, the standardized letter of evaluation that is required for EM residency programs. We provide a slow, my education team for every student who rotates through and requests one. Um, the vast majority of students will request one and we expect to be writing them. So I, you know, when I do orientation on day one, I tell the students, look, you guys are here. I know a lot of you are applying to this specialty. We are able to provide you with a departmental letter, the standardized letter of evaluation for EM programs. So I say that up front. If your program, you know, in your first day doesn't mention that, I think it's totally fair game to ask and say, hey, what is your policy for letters of recommendation? We all know that you are here and applying to residency and you're going to want a letter. So that is totally to ask up front is, is very much fair game. And sticking with you, Nicole, are there other things that students should do, other interactions they should try and have, other things to consider when they're on their rotations? 
Yeah, and I think Isabel kind of got into this a little bit, but I'll reiterate, you want to put on your best face. Residency programs, regardless of the specialty, are looking for students who are engaged, who are hard workers, who are willing to go the extra mile for their patients and the rest of their team. Keep this in mind while you are on your clinical shifts or on, on rounds or whatever, or in the OR or whatnot. You want to really put forth your all, meaning you, you're not going to know everything clinically. That's why you're a student, and that's why you have years and years of residency training in your specialty ahead of you. But put forth your best effort. Read up on those cases when you get home that were unclear to you. So next time you have a similar presentation or a similar chief complaint, you're able to have that knowledge and, and, and get smarter throughout the month and show that. The other things too are those, those non-medical you know medical knowledge type skills, like ability to work with a team. Be courteous to everyone you interact with, the nurses, the clerkship coordinators, the administrators up in your department's office, Everyone there, it counts. If you have a bad interaction with someone or you blow someone off, that's, you know, it seems like it would be common sense, but that's going to get back to the program. Um, while you're on your shifts or your clinical experiences, be engaged the whole time. Don't be sitting there on your cell phone, texting your friends, like be engaged in patient care. If you don't have a patient or something going on at that time, go follow the junior residents or the senior residents into some of the other patients and really capitalize on all those learning opportunities while you're there. That goes a long way. That's what we want to see in, in when we're selecting residency candidates. You don't have to know all the medicine of your specialty at this point in your training. It's not expected, but we want to see that you have potential, you're a team player, you're going to be hardworking, and you're taking control of your own education. And Isabel, um, what should students expect or, you know, or try and do after the rotation, they come, hopefully they have a wonderful experience. They get a letter of recommendation. Hopefully they want to rank us highly on there. They get offered an interview or things along those lines. But what should students truly expect as far as post-rotation expectations, communications, interactions, anything like that? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious as to what your experiences are. Uh, in our department, there is no real expectation around post-rotation experiences, you know, so you, when people come for the experience, you kind of give it what you got, you know what I mean, and then you're on to the next rotation. I think some students who have established nice relationships with residents or even faculty have stayed in touch with them. I don't think that's necessarily an expectation, uh, but certainly once in a while, you know, a, a student will really hit it off with a resident or might even start doing a little bit of work with a faculty member, staying in touch that way, maybe contacting them when your application is in, right? When you're applying, saying, hey, I applied, I'm really looking forward. You know, I've, I've certainly gotten emails from faculty saying, hey, look out for, you know, such and such because they rotated with us and we thought they were really terrific, right? Um, sometimes though, the people that you rotated with can kind of bring you to the attention of the program director, right? Like I. I, I was thinking I got like, you know, 1300 applications, right, for 16 spots. Um, and it was really nice once in a while, right, to have a faculty member say, I worked with such and such, please make sure you take a really good look at their application. And of course I would, right, because I know that this person had a really good experience. So I think that's, you know, it's possible to do that as well. Awesome. Um, so we're going to go to Q&A now. And Andy, I think there's two questions that I would like to pose to you uh, right off the bat in. Uh, the first question is, does applying early increase chances of placement? And similar to that, uh, are applications reviewed on a rolling basis, even if they've applied to rotations and it's several months out? Okay, so um, it depends, actually. There are some rotations where they actually hold spots for visiting students. And then there are other rotations rotations that just have an overall uh, maximum amount of students they're able to have in a rotation. The, the first scenario, it, it kind of, the earlier you apply, the better. The other um, scenario, our HMS students hold scheduling priority up until 90 days prior to the start of each rotation month if there are not spots held. It's hard to distinguish between the two. Um, I, my recommendation would be to go on to the hospital websites in the specialty you're interested in, and usually they detail if um, applying early or if there are 
um, possibilities earlier than that 90 days. If, if it's just um, the maximum enrollment for visiting students is X, then it is um, it, it, our HMS students will priority 90 days and then we release any unfilled spots. So it's just kind of two different scenarios. I hope that answers that. Um, Isabel, you know, maybe there's a student who has a particular area within a niche aspect of psychiatry. Um, and I'm trying to merge two questions here. So or maybe one question is asking about, you know, they may be interested in HIV psychiatry or neuropsychiatry. If that isn't offered as a rotation, will students still have those experiences or how can they go about getting that, um, uh, that extra exposure during a rotation, uh, even if those rotations may not be offered? Well, I think certainly if, if you're on a rotation, uh, let's say you're on emergency psychiatry and you have interest in HIV or neuropsychiatry, I think it's a great opportunity. I mean, I think you mentioned, you know, potentially exploring rotations at the other hospitals, but certainly within that department, right, saying, oh, these are really my interests. And more than, I think it'd be extremely likely that the faculty would set you up, right, to at least go and experience those, maybe those clinics or those experiences for a day or two. I think faculty know that you're there to really kind of, you know, learn what there is. And if you have an interest, I think people will really support that. Um, so I think that's definite. I saw the picture, the question about, you know, if it's earlier, you know, do you have, I mean, I, I think it's always nice to like, if you could, if you have the opportunity to attend rounds or to participate in research with someone, go for it. Do you know what I mean? Um, you know, and I've known, I've had a lot of students kind of just cold email me. Do you know what I mean? Um, I think people are really receptive to that. Someone who's excited, interested in learning. Um, I've had a lot of, you know, students email me about maybe research opportunities and I'll go ahead and I'll put them in touch with people. Um, and I don't know, I think our faculty are really receptive uh, to students uh, from different institutions who wanna work with them. So I think even beforehand, I think it's fine to attend rounds, uh, start trying to get to know people, reach out to faculty to see if there's things you can participate in. And then if you're on the rotation and you have specific interests, just asking if you could visit those other services to learn about them. All right. Well, what I would say is um, I recognize that we're ending, uh, getting cl close to the end of time. So I just want to go just around the um, to the different panelists and say, if there, is there one other piece of advice, either from the application uh, aspect or from just making sure that the students have the best experience possible? Any other advice you may have for students? And so I'll start with you, Andy. Any other pearls or pieces of wisdom that we haven't touched on in this discussion so far? I, th I would say the biggest thing is to make sure you have a complete application with everything that is required um, because the moment I send back your application for missing documentation, we can't see it. So if let's say you have contact with a rotation, they say, yes, we have a spot for you, but I can't see your application because it's incomplete. We cannot schedule you. So I think that's a really um, important. Make sure that all your immunizations are up to date and what is required. Um, read everything thoroughly, make sure that you upload the correct file. So I got a, a um, picture of somebody's dog once by accident. So things like that. <laughs> it would be great to have a dog on the rotation. However, <laughs> um, there's some extra clearances we have to go through for that to actually happen. Um, Lynn, do you have any other pieces of advice for students as they're going to be applying to the VCP? We have two essays in the VCP application, and I just encourage you to pay close attention to them. One of them is focused on what your career goals are, and the other one, um, very important, is how you think you could progress in your career by having a residency, or I'm sorry, having a clerkship here. So pay close attention to those. A lot of students don't, and that's important information in making the decision about whether or not you should be in our program. Yeah, and I think one of the things that we try and stress with our application to the VCP, our goal is to put you in a better position um, to complete your ERAS application, which you will be doing. And so having that um, first letter of recommendation ready and having some of those thoughts already drafted out in our um, VCP application, we hope those are building blocks to your final application uh, for residency. Dr. Dubash, any parting advice? 
Pay attention to those deadlines. Half of it is getting the spot. I realize this is a stressful time. Many of you are applying to visiting clerkships at many different institutions. If you know where you want to go, don't hesitate to reach out to that clerkship director too. Different schools have different protocols, even within our hospitals here. Um, you know, if I get an email from you and you say, I'm applying here, you get your, your uh, VSLO in so Andy can see it and you tell me, I want to come here this month, we can help coordinate and make that happen. And last but not least, Dr. Lagosimo. Um, I guess I would say, I think, you know, I think in your trajectory currently, right, everything is very stressful and very performance driven. Um, and uh, there's a lot of gamesmanship. But I, but I guess in the end, I would say to just try to have fun and dream big and see this as an opportunity. Do you know, like the rotations I did were not rotations my school had. Um, and I just wanted to, I love psychiatry. And I wanted to try those aspects of psychiatry that I wouldn't have had the chance. Do you know what I mean? It was like, a, it was a dream to do. Um, and to have fun with it and to see if you, when you go, you really feel engaged and you really see yourself among those people and see the, the physician that you want to become with those people. Um, so I guess to, I guess, I guess I'm a psychiatrist, right? But to really go in with your heart and, and with how you feel when you're there, um, that it's not all about being, you know, so driven and doing everything perfectly and meeting every single criteria, but do something fun, have fun with it, be yourself and see if that's a place where you would be happy. Awesome. Well, I want to say thank you to all the panelists for being here. Thank you for sharing your expertise, your wisdom, um, and helping to support the students as they go through uh, this phase of their career. Uh, thank you to Lynn for um, pulling this together and doing all the background work and getting us here. And thank you to all the students who joined us uh, to listen in on this webinar. We look forward to seeing you. Uh, we look forward to seeing your applications uh, through VSAS and, and VCP. We look forward to having you come and rotate with us. And uh, good luck with the rest of your careers and have a good rest of your afternoon. Take care, everyone. Thank you.